So this week we're going to finish kinematics and switch to forces. Okay, so uh, the place where I usually print the poster, I was caught off guard. They're closed for Labor Day. I thought you were supposed to work on Labor Day. Apparently not. Uh, so here's the poster. It'll be there next time. But here's what we're going to talk about this week. We're talking about what forces do and when they do it. Right? Newton's laws. You may have heard of Newton's laws. How to calculate these four. Okay, this is a part of the class I have contracted down a little bit to get to the important stuff later. Remember I told you I was going to cut a little bit of normal intro mechanics out. So for this week, we're just doing four forces, not the big list of 12 forces usually you go through. We'll get to some of them later, buoyancy and drag, etc. And you may have heard of free body diagram. My God, uh, free body diagrams. I thought like a shadow was attacking me there. Free body diagrams and net forces, and we'll do kinematics using forces instead of just being given accelerations. And then, of course, the kind of pointless, but just you got to do it, action-reaction pairs. I'm not really sure why we obsess with those at this level, but it's tradition, so we have to. Um, so, uh, let's see, then to get started, let's talk about what we've been talking about. And remember that we were talking about kinematics. So kinematics was, what was it, a mathematical description or something? Here I want to tell you it's how something moves. All right? It's not why, it's just how. Okay? So we did two weeks of kinematics. So all the kinesiology majors, I'm sure we're in heaven for two weeks. We were studying your major for two weeks. Now we're doing dynamics. Oh. So dynamics isn't how something moves, it's why something moves. Yes. That is the difference. This week, we're talking about why. And the answer, of course, is forces. And we love to think about our historical, where did it all come from? At least I do. I, you have to, because I'm in charge. And the big question, of course, that drove a lot of this thought and a lot of the invention of physics, trying to figure out what is the natural state of motion. That was the big question for 2,000 years, for more than 2,000 years. What is it? And it's very hard to figure out because the forces you're going to learn about today throw off your intuition. You might say, is it rest? When you just set something down, it stays at rest until you do something to it, unless it's on a crooked table. All right. Is it um, accelerating down? If you leave something alone, it tends to fall down. So maybe that's the natural state of motion. But why down and not sideways? That's kind of weird. Is it uh, constant velocity? Maybe that's the natural state of motion. Because if you have something heavy and you kind of get it going, it kind of tends to keep going, right? I mean, it's like it, it looks like it wants to go on forever. And you can say, well, eventually it stops, but maybe eventually it's interacting with something else. Oh, yeah. So this was sort of the big uh, thing we're trying to figure out. But it's hard to figure out because things behave so strangely. So the guy that figured out is, of course, Isaac Newton, right? So Galileo described how motion works mathematically acceleration down, position goes as t squared, Descartes, I don't know, he put some math on it. But then Newton is really uh, the big one that, that figured it out. And I want you to know Newton <coughs> was a little bit, uh, the nice word is eccentric, okay? Newton wasn't much of a people person. So he discovered the laws of motion we're going to talk about, he invented calculus, and uh, he invented most of optics, he figured out most of optics. Yet on his deathbed, he told the doctor, my greatest accomplishment is that I will die a virgin. That's what he said. That's actually kind of the opposite of an accomplishment technically, but I'm not going <laughs> to nitpick Newton, okay? So I'm doing a really horrible job of selling the physics major, I know. Right? <laughs> no beer, no sex. Come on, who's on? Right? Let's go. It's, it's the greatest major. Um, so Newton said, he looked at all this, and he started to figure it out. He said, okay, let's just start. Let's just jump in with Newton's first law, okay? And this is something that you can probably, it's almost sing-song-like. You can probably recite it. Oh, there's, uh, I went into Old English for a second there, sorry. So, and let's all say it together. Maybe we'll say it together. One, two, three. An object in motion remains in motion. I can't write and say, and an object at rest remains at rest. 
unless acted on by a net force. An object, okay, that didn't work. An object in motion remains in motion and an object at rest, I really should use PowerPoint, remains at rest, right, unless acted on by a net force. So if you want to be a famous physicist, no drinking, no sex, but if you make up a law that you want to be famous, make it kind of sing-songy. Make it fun to say, an object in motion remains in motion, an object remains at rest, remains at rest, and let's act it on, and this is kind of the coda that kind of sucks, and let's act it on by a net force. I don't know what a coda is. Fear you won't call me on that. Okay. So let's look at this and see, uh, there's a few little parts of the sing-songy version, though, that you got to get a little more specific. So he wasn't super specific the way he worded it, because it was more about the style, you know, the music part. Um, so an object in motion, what does this mean? Remains in motion. What does that mean? So he's just saying constant velocity. Unfortunately, I broke it at the end there. But that's what this means. It remains in motion. If you read the original, if you get out your principias and read the original Latin, it's not, he didn't exactly say velocity. He said there's a state of motion, and he basically meant velocity. Right? And then uh, this is an important part. It's not unless it on, it's acted on by a force. It's unless it's acted on by a net force, right? We know that force, so I'm going to tell you that force is a vector, and you can add up a bunch of vectors to get the total vector, and it's the total force that matters. What's a force? Let's define a force, a mathematical push or pull. Uh, in the unit is Newtons, which is abbreviated in, okay? So all your forces will be in Newtons or maybe millinewtons or micronewtons. And one Newton equals one kilogram per meter sec per second squared. One Newton equals one. We'll see the formulas later. Kilogram meters per second squared. And we tend to think it's always been that way. Probably Newton named the unit after himself, right? No. So the unit of the Newton was invented and it was declared in 1946. Relatively new name of a unit. If you could have Einstein try to do your homework, you'd be like, I don't know what the hell this is. I mean, we're, what's a Newton? Yeah. Um, where's the dynes? Um, but remember though, force is that, it's a Newton's. Objects can experience multiple forces, can experience, uh, multiple forces that some like vectors, that add as vectors. That add. We are going to do some math today, I promise. These are just the basic facts that we have to write down. Okay? Newton's first law and forces. That's all you need to know. Let's see. Uh, la la la. Mm. Okay, I have this on, I don't have my watch. There'll be lots of questions. I should get all the questions this time. Okay, so now we're gonna, where'd my lights go? Now we're gonna go through the forces. So I said that you would need four forces, right? So what were the ones we were gonna go over? Let's see, we talked a little bit about this, we'll be doing a lot of this, but here we go. Gravitational, normal, friction, and tension. So let's do the first one, let's do weight. The first force we got to think about here. Now, I'm going to do a definition a little simpler than what you'll see in the book, and I'll explain the difference. But let's just go with 99.9% .9 of the time, what you mean by the weight, okay? The force of gravity on all objects near the Earth at all times. It doesn't turn on and off. And there's something that confused people two thousand for 2,000 years. Gravity seems to pull it down, but now it stopped. Where'd it go? Where'd the gravity go? Oh, there it is. So oh, it now stopped again. It looks like gravity turns on and off, depending on if something is supported or not. But it doesn't. It's always there. Right? It's 
Always there. And do you feel gravity? Do you feel your weight? No, you don't. So that's, that's part of the reason it's hard to know. So the symbol we'll use for weight is a lowercase w vector. right? And the formula for weight is it's the mass times the gravitational acceleration. So this is a constant of the universe, or a constant of being near the Earth, where g is the gravitational acceleration, um, its magnitude. Remember, those are the magnitude bars. It equals 9.8 meters per second squared. It's really 9.81, but we don't need the 1. Just use 9.8. It varies as you move around. Okay, um, And the direction is down. There you go. The direction is down. What does down mean? Uh, towards the center of the Earth. Ah, toward the center of the Earth. If you want to get technical, the Earth is spherical. I don't know. You might read differently on the Internet or from the president or something, but the Earth is a sphere. Um, the only other weird thing about weight is if I were to say I want to do a vector diagram of weight, well, where do I draw the vector? Remember, we used to worry about where, when we talked about position, velocity, acceleration, we kind of said position you have to draw from the origin because you're usually drawing an xy coordinate system that's actually space, and position is space, so it matters where your position vector goes. Velocity and acceleration vectors is sort of an artistic choice. All right? If something is moving with a velocity, put the vector on it. It looks nicer. Weight is not really an artistic choice. Technically, it acts at the center of mass. Okay. It effectively acts at the center of mass, which I'll abbreviate COM. And later in the class, we'll actually calculate where the center of mass is. But here's a preview. It's in the center. Okay. So if it's a square or a rectangle, it's in the middle. Right? So, so if you're going to try to draw it and make it sort of physically accurate, you would want to draw your weight vector right there. And we'll get more into drawing and free body diagrams in a minute. But that is where it acts. Okay. Let's see. So that's that's weight. Now, th what's confusing is if you read the book, and they're technically they're correct, is that you can also define weight as the normal force, uh, or as the reading on a scale. Right. So you could say mg is the gravitational force pushing you down. The weight is what pushes back up on you when you stand on something. Thing says, so take a spring scale. You don't know how that works, but just take one and stand on it, and that's your weight. And then you get into weird things about how that changes when you accelerate, and that's your apparent weight, not your true weight. Blah, blah, blah. Let's not worry about that. For what we're going to do for most of the time, weight is just mg. Okay? And it's so standard that it's just mg. A lot of times when I do a drawing, I'll just put mg like this. I'll try to remember to put w, but most people just write mg. Okay? But there are weird cases when things are accelerating where the definition of weight gets a little funky, but don't worry about it. Okay. So we got weight, we got g, we got the center of mass bullet here. What else do we need to say? Um, yeah, let's, okay, so what is mass? Right? We haven't talked about mass. Um, mass is a little weird and confusing. Right now I'm just going to tell you uh, the important thing is that mass is the quantity of matter that something has, right? So this has a small mass. This has a bigger mass. It's how many uh, electrons and uh, nucleons are in it, OK? It's an intrinsic property of something. How much mass it is is how much mass it is. It doesn't matter where you go, OK? Technically, weight is extrinsic. Or I don't know if extrinsic is the right word. Weight um, depends on local gravity. So just we, the main thing is not to use those interchangeably. Now, you're definitely not going to use them interchangeably because mass is a scalar. It has nothing to do with uh, weight or force or gravity. It's just a property of something, and it's a scalar. It's just the mass. It's how much there is. And weight is how gravity acts on that mass. That's a vector pointing to the center of the Earth. And uh, weight varies because really this 9.8 is sort of the average near. If you go up high enough, it goes down. G, little g gets smaller when you get really high up in the air. We'll calculate that later. As you move across the Earth, little g gets smaller because the amount of matter, mass right under you matters. 
right? So this is how they find oil, right? You drive the ship around and measure G fluctuating. I just had a guy in my office describing this in excruciating detail um, a few weeks ago. Uh, how they have uh, very sensitive <coughs> devices that measure G with a bunch of gyroscopes spinning around. And uh, they fly it or they do it a ship or an airplane. And when they see low G, they know there's oil there right? because oil is less dense than rocks. So the variation of G um, is important and is mostly measured to find oil or sometimes in demonstrations. Um, let's see. Right. And then the last thing about weight, I won't write it down. It's not really important. It's just for fun is that you can't feel your weight. Right. We uh, were born, evolved and grew up feeling MG. So we don't really sense it. When you think you feel your weight, you're feeling something pushing up on you, right? If I stand here and I feel like I can feel my weight, I really feel the floor applying a normal force, which is our next force. I can't really inherently feel my weight. If I jump or if I'm, you know, in some, I'm in free fall for some reason, some uh, uh, ride at an amusement park, I feel, I feel nothing. But MG is still acting on me, right? If I, I'm falling on one of those, what's the thing where you're on a big rubber band and you hope it doesn't break. If I'm bungee jumping, um, I'm weightless for a minute, but weightless is a misnomer, right? I still have a weight force, I just don't feel it. So there's a lot of misnomers out there. Roman statue, have you ever heard of that? No. Okay. Um, so the next force, then that was weight. Now let's do normal force. Let's see. Normal force. And you're going to think, I learned normal force in high school. How could he possibly complicate and make normal force confusing. <laughs> here we go. Okay, here we go. So the normal force. All right. When you push something, it pushes back. That's really all it is. Normal force. So take your hand like this and push it with your finger like that, right? I mostly just want to watch you do this. It's funny to me, right? But if you do that, you're pushing your hand and your hand goes, oh, I felt, oh my God, stop, right? Your hand feels this big force, but nothing about your finger. Oh, you feel a force on your finger too, don't you? There's no way to push your hand without feeling a force on your finger. <sighs> okay, there is, but with your finger, there's no way to push your force your hand without feeling a force on your finger. So whenever any two things push on each other, they both feel a force. They both feel the same force. Right? So that's the normal force. So really, it's sometimes called a contact force. Okay? We're just going to use the word normal force for all the occurrences, no matter what direction it is. Anytime two things push on each other, we'll call it a normal force, and we'll use a little n, because that's what the book uses, little n. Okay? So let's think about this. If it's a vector, all forces are vectors. And the first thing we think about is the direction and the magnitude, right? The direction of the normal force is perpendicular to the surface that creates it. And you could say, isn't that arbitrary? The, no. Any two surfaces in contact at a teeny point is making a line. It has a direction. Even if I have a round thing touching a, 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 a flat thing, at some little point, microscopic point, it's an area, right? It has a direction. If I have a perfectly round object hitting a perfectly flat object, then the normal force is this way. Right? So there's always a direction perpendicular to the surface where the two things interact. Because if, if you want to get specific, they interact at just a point, there's even a direction at just a point, okay? What is the magnitude of a normal force? Okay, it's not very mathematical, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. However much I have to scream up here to teach you physics, it will happen. I'm like a normal force, okay? Whatever it takes. Um, so let's see, let's think about a normal force here. Here we go. Here's a block sitting on a table like that. Ah. And let's draw that. Let's see. So here's the table like this. And this little marks here mean it's a solid table. It's not going anywhere. And uh, here is the block sitting on the table. It's a block with mass M. Hmm, yeah. So let's see. Let's draw some forces on here. Let's draw the weight 
Oh, the weight acts at the center of mass. Center of mass is at the center. All right. Now let's draw the normal force. And you say, okay, well, the normal force, let's see, the table must be pushing up on the block like that. But wait, he also said the block pushes down on the table like that. Well, which, oh, those are two normal forces in opposite directions. Now I'm confused. I don't know what, what happened, right? So this is what we want to think about using a free body diagram, right? So this is this, direction, magnitude. And now on a side, we'll use our normal force and our gravitational weight to think about uh, use a free body diagram. Free, I'm not even going to write it out. Free body diagram, the forces on one object. Because two things got confusing when we tried to do this. One is we need some better notation to talk about who is pushing on whom. And it's getting messy. It's messy here, right? It's messy. I don't like it. So right now, every object we're drawing and thinking about, we're actually treating as a point mass. Okay? We're not actually considering that it has a size and a shape. We'll think about that when we get to rotation. But for now, it's a point mass. So if I were going to draw a free body diagram of the block, I would put something there. These poor poli sci grad students have to listen to me shout for 70 minutes. I would put just a point and say, there's the block, right? That's it. And then it's easy. You put all the vectors on the block. So here's weight. Oh, it lost weight. And then where do you draw the normal force? Also, just draw on the point like that. Normal force. And then use subscripts to help you keep up with which normal force you're talking about. So usually the first one is what's doing the pushing, and the second one is what's receiving the pushing. So I would call this uh, the T dash B. That's the normal force of the table on the block. This one down here was the normal force of the block on the table. But we're not putting that on here because that's on the table, right? This is the free body diagram for the block, right? So there it is, your first free body diagram. Isn't that more clear? than this? Don't you want to do this? So it's hard to get people to do free body diagrams because you can kind of, you could figure it out from here. But sometimes when things get confusing and you get an angle and more and more components, you need to do them. Okay, so do them if you need them. We strongly recommend them. All right. Let's see. Now sometimes people wonder, um, let's see, oh yeah. So now let's apply uh, Newton's first law to get the magnitude. Apply N1 is what I call it. N1, N2, and N3. Okay? N1, N2, and N3. N1 said if that thing's not moving, and it's not moving, then the net force must be zero. The net force means you add the forces. So let's just add these two vectors and say it must be zero. The normal force of the table on the block plus the weight equals zero. There we go. That's it. I, I wrote them in vector form, right? So let's say, let's solve for the normal force of the table on the block. It's equal to the minus of the weight vector. That's all you need to know. Because now that's what we know what it is. It's the opposite of this, right? So mathematically, there's not much to this. You can say, well, then the magnitude of the normal force of the table on the block is what we care about. It's equal to mg, because that's what the magnitude of the weight is equal to. Right? And the direction is the opposite negative of weight, so it's up. So there's your normal force. We calculated it. And what was the magnitude? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to make Newton's laws true is what the magnitude will be. And you say, how can it do that? Right? The table is not sentient. Right? The table isn't watching me. What kind of is. Right? The table's not watching what I'm doing. So right now, the table's applying a normal force equal to the weight. What if I push down on it? Right? If I push on it with my finger, oh, then there's a normal force between my finger and the mass, and then there's another force pushing down. We would put it here, and then these, the normal force pushing up would have to be my weight plus the finger magnitude. We'll do the details in a minute, right? So if I push down, the normal force went up. Then I release it, the normal force went back down. And I push it down, I release it. How does it know? How can it figure it out? It's so smart, right? Hmm. Basically, if you want to try to get an intuition for normal forces, is just realize that when I do that, I'm deforming the table, okay? And the table acts like a really stiff spring. So just think of everything you touch. All solid objects are stiff springs when you push them together. Even if they appear rigid, they're really stiff, right? That's deflecting probably quite a bit. It's a 100-year-old table, okay? 
So that's how normal forces work. That's why they can take whatever value it takes. Why is there normal force going down on the block? No, I didn't mean to draw it down. Ah, yeah, because you didn't do a free bind diagram. There's no normal force going down on the block. That's the normal force of the block on the table. That's why we draw the free body diagram, as you saw something on the table and thought it was the block. Thank you for illustrating my point so perfectly. I planted that. Dr. Stenson texted that one in. Um, now let's look and see that. So you may say from this like crystal clear, incredible explanation that almost brought a tear to your eye, you might think, well, OK, well, normal forces are easy. They're just always equal to the weight. Right? So no, no, no. Normal forces is not always um, equal to weight. Let's find a case where one is not equal to the weight. So now we have two blocks. Here we go. One block, another block. Very exciting. OK, so now let's look at uh, uh, the, let's describe the situation here. We got M2 on top. And we have M1 on bottom, and we have the Earth here. And they're sitting on a table or the Earth or some rigid, rigid object that's not going anywhere. All right, there they are. Why is there normal force going down on the block? Uh, there isn't. It's up on the block. So I don't know. There's normal force up, weight down. Normal force weight, it's up. There's about to be one going down on the block. I promise. Here we go. So what we want to do is think about normal forces and draw a free body diagram. Actually, let's screw it up first. Let's not. Let's say you're a rebel, and I, I like rebels, but let me just say it's not a good idea here. Let me show you why. Okay, well, I don't need a free body diagram. I, I got a four on the AP, whatever. Uh, M1G down, M2G down. Let's see the normal force up of two on one, and of course the normal force down one on two, and then the Earth. Uh, on two, and then of course two on the earth. There, that's perfect, right? Why do I need a free body diagram? Okay, so let's do the free body diagram for M2. All right, here it is. Um, so M2 was the top one, I messed it all up. So M2G down is the weight, weight two, or we could write M2G is what I would normally write. And then, what is this feeling of normal force of? Well, it's only touching one thing, right? It's touching M1. So it must be the normal force of 1 on 2. The normal force at block 1 is pushing on block 2. And that's it, right? Newton's first law says it's not moving. So therefore, N1-2 plus M2G must be equal to 0. So we can solve for M12. We're going to find it's equal to the weight. It's going to be equal to its weight. Okay. So in this case, it is equal to its weight for the top block. Right? The magnitude of N12 does equal M2G. That's not our counterexample. Okay. But now, let's look at the middle block. Why is there no normal force? Oh, are the two normal forces equal magnitude? Uh, yes. So whenever two things touch, the normal forces make a pair of forces that are always equal and opposite. Okay, we don't really need that right now, but we will be, of course, talking about that later. Okay, so let's do FBD, free body diagram of mass one. All right, mass one, I'll do the first one. Uh, weight down one. All right, okay. And uh, it's got the earth pushing up on it. So there's gonna be a normal force pushing up. Normal force of the Earth on one, right? And you could say you're done, but you're not, because it's also touching two. This one is touching this one. So there's a force of two on one. Which way? Down, right? When something pushes on you, it pushes into you. Something doesn't suck on, I mean, you know, it pushes, it doesn't suck. Normal forces don't suck, I don't know. So it pushes down. So it must be that in two on one is down. Right? So then you say, OK, having your free body diagram sucks, because now we've got to draw two parallel. Yes, I know. OK, so here we go. Normal two on one. There you go. So now those have to vector sum to be 0. If we're not moving, not moving, then these have to add to be 0. And I don't want to obsess with this right now, because we're going to obsess with vector sums in a minute. But basically, in the end, you see that the normal force that the Earth applies to 1 
equals m1g plus uh, n21. And you can kind of see that probably intuitively. This one is being pushed down by its own weight and by the weight of uh, m, uh, m2. Both of those are pushing down, so the Earth has to push back with the weight of both. In fact, since n21 uh, is equal and opposite to n12, it's m2g. So you could say that the magnitude is m1 plus m2g, which, of course, that's what happens. If you think of this as one object, what's its mass? m1 plus m2. And it's feeling like normal force equal to the weight of m1 plus m2. If you think of it as two objects, then this middle one actually has multiple normal forces with different values. Okay? So it's not just every time you just say normal force is the weight. Okay? We'll make it even more confusing here in a minute. Oh, we'll do it right now. Let's see. Let's see what else we can do with this. I'll set it up and we'll finish it after. Why doesn't M2G become negative when you move to the right side? Okay, in the next problem, I'm going to take you through the exact way to do the negative signs. That's why I blew it off there, so we don't have all day. So we're going to do the exact negative signs, even more correct than the book. Okay, I'll even show you where the book sells you out here, and you're going to see it all. So let's just get it set up, and then we'll do it in the second half. So we just agreed that normal forces are not always equal to the weight. And we're also going to check that normal forces are not always vertical. They can be any direction. And I'm making these contrasts because if you've only ever done simple problems, then the normal force was just a quick trivial thing and you pointed it up and said it's equal to the weight, but that's not the case. So what we're going to do is take, I guess we'll put this here and say, what if the ball is like this? I didn't test this ahead of time. I don't know what's going to happen. Ah, like that. Okay. So the ball is like that. It didn't go anywhere. And the ramp is at an angle. Everybody can see. Okay. Just look at the drawing. Okay, there we go. Let's just look at the drawing. So let's say we have a, a ramp like this at some angle theta here, and we have a block here. So this is all stationary stuff, not going anywhere. And we put how here, a ball of mass M here. And we're going to call this surface A, and we're going to call this surface B. All right? So we want to find the normal forces. Right. Which way do they go? How big are they, etc.? So let's do the free body diagram first, and then we'll obsess with the math later. Okay, so free body diagram for the sphere. Mm, here it is. It's a point. We'll draw mg down. That's the weight of the sphere, mg. There, see, I switched to mg instead of w. Uh, yeah, no, I already answered that. Okay. And now we have two normal forces, and which way is the normal force? It's always perpendicular to the surface. Right? So now I've tilted the surface, so now they're off at an angle. So we're going to call this one uh, the normal force of B, right, like that, because that's surface B pushing on the mass. We're going to make it a little simpler. We're not going to use two things because everything's pushing on one thing. So we're not going to write BM and AM. We're just going to call it the normal force of B. So you've got to make these decisions when you get started. Okay. And there's also a normal force of A, and where is it? It's perpendicular to the surface, like that. Normal force of A. So the question we're going to answer is we're going to find in A and in B in terms of M and theta and G. Okay. Okay, so we'll do that in five minutes, if you can wait. Okay, let's do this problem. Here we go. It's going to be exciting now. Oh, wait, one question. Oh, there's always one. Uh, what if the thing is so heavy it destroys the table, right? So then it's not a normal force anymore. But we are living in the ideal world of, pretend world of intro physics, where, you know, certain things are just stuck and don't fall. And you can't deform anything, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, if you crush it, then you're doing like contact mechanics and you're doing real world stuff. And we don't talk about that here. So let's not get into that. OK? OK, so now, very good question. As you know, and I actually did it on purpose, is when I did the two normal forces at the same time, I said, oh, yeah, some algebra. This goes over there. Don't worry about the negative sign. Here's the answer. 
That's how we do most physics problems. Oh, here's some components, and oh, that negative, well, because it's the other way. The negative's wrong at the end. Probably something was the other way at one point. Here's the answer. That's how we do intro physics, if you ever notice. Okay? That's how you do it. That's how I do it, etc. So now, this problem, I'm going to drag you through exactly what you're doing between vectors and vector components and polar and Cartesian all the way through. We're going to do it once. Okay? I want you to see where all the weird negative stuff is happening. And then I'll go back to the normal way. Okay? So if you're ever confused about where'd that negative come from, you need to go look at these notes again. Here we go. All we're going to do is say this thing was sitting here. The point was the normal forces can be weird directions. And let's get these normal forces. Let's get the magnitude of these normal forces. That's what we want to do. All right? We're going to do it in a normal Cartesian coordinate system, x this way and y that way. Okay. And we don't even have any, we only have Newton's first law, but that's all we need because it's not moving. All right, it's sitting still. So we said Newton's first law says there's zero net force um, in the x direction. That's one thing we know, right? So we need to add all the forces in the x direction and set them equal to zero. And how are we going to do that? Vectors, components, polar, Cartesian, magnitudes, directions, or just put some letters and not worry about it. Right? So let's think. Let's write it like uh, this. Let's write it as x components. After all, we are in a Cartesian coordinate system. So it would seem we might as well use Cartesian coordinates and uh, write components. Okay? Components of the vector in A and the vector in B. Okay, so if you're writing components, the standard thing to write is to say in A, x component. And now we want to add the in B. So you can see in A is kind of positive, and in B, the component, we can draw them like that, is kind of negative. But you don't put a negative sign on a component. In uh, B, x equals 0. Okay, don't make components negative. Because you're letting the equation tell you whether or not it's negative. If you program in the fact that it's negative, then the equation will just tell you the magnitude, probably. But if you really want to know, like, you're, if you can't look at this and you can't tell which way NB is, then that's OK. You just write this. We'll get the negative part later. Okay. So if you're seeing something written with little components, little x's, you don't make it negative. Your book kind of goes through this on page, the third edition is page 140, section 6.1. My fourth edition was at another place I couldn't check. But in their little box, when they're talking about adding up tensions, I think, they sort of walk through this. You don't make components negative. Now, calculate the components. Components. And are they given to us in polar or Cartesian? They're given to us in polar. We have a drawing. We have the length of the vectors kind of represented. We'd like to figure out what they are. And we have angles. We have thetas, because I told you the theta right there. So we are in polar. So calculate the components from the magnitude and the direction. Okay. All right, so here we go. That's what we're going to attempt to do right here. OK. So we say, how do we get the horizontal component of this vector? Right? Basically, we are converting from polar to Cartesian. Right? The horizontal component, the x component, is Cartesian. This is polar. You may remember it was the length times the cosine of theta. Right? So that's all we've got to write. Why do the normals equal 0? Because it's not moving. It's not moving in the x direction. And Newton's first law says uh, an object at rest remains at rest unless there's a force on it. So if, there's no, if it's at rest, there must be no force on it. So that's why the forces have to add to 0. Um, OK, so let's write it down. Here we go. x component of Na. You ready? Here it is. It's Na, the magnitude, times the cosine of theta, right? This is the magnitude. If I write a vector without the arrow on top, that's the magnitude, OK? It's not the vector component in x or something like that. If I put an x on it, it's a component. It can be negative. 
If I leave uh, nothing on it, it's a magnitude and it can only be positive. That's the technical rule that we largely follow. Sometimes people might forget to put their x on here and write it this way and mean the component, but they wrote it as a magnitude. To play it safe, you can constantly write n a with a vector sign and two bars. Everybody hates that. Right? It's ugly, it's messy, etc. So I just want to be clear that I just meant magnitude right there, and I meant the polar angle, and this is the standard angle. The magnitude there, standard angle there. Standard meaning, you know, defined counterclockwise from the horizontal axis, which is basically how we define this one. Ah, that was easy. Okay, now, what about the second one? Now that we're getting... Uh, uh, not components, now that, we're, now that we're calculating the value of the components, it's this way, isn't it? Is this when you put the negative in? This is when the book says to put the negative in. And if you're like some basic pumpkin spice latte sieving pre-med, you would put the negative in. <laughs> but we're not going to do that! We're going to do it right! You put plus! When we talked about polar to, to Cartesian, did we put negative signs in things? No. We said all it is is the magnitude times the cosine of the properly defined angle, okay? So we're gonna say plus the magnitude in B times the cosine of the properly defined angle. And what is that? Theta plus 90, right? This is 90 because this is 90. I didn't tell you that, all right? So those are perpendicular to each other. So the angle is the counterclockwise from the horizontal axis. So theta plus 90. Right? That's the way you do it. I didn't fake any negative signs. I faked anything. No. I didn't put any neg I didn't artificially put in a single negative sign. And now I'm going to say n a cosine theta and I'm going to google. I literally last night googled cosine of x plus pi over 2. That's how I find these things out. Okay? I don't have them memorized. If you google cosine of something it just shows you a little graph. And I looked at it and said, "Oh, that's a negative sign." That's how I figured out. You find your own way. Minus n b sine of theta. Okay? Has to equal zero. So there is where the negative sign showed up naturally mathematically. It just showed us by using a trig identity that uh, if we define this angle here, that means it's really this angle here. The reason it became a sign is because this angle is this angle from the vertical. So the sine is the x is the x component. And the negative sign showed up because it's in the negative direction. But really we just applied a trig identity right here. All right. That got some questions going. Here we go. <sighs> Isn't the angle 180 minus theta? No. Look at the angle more carefully. So when you want to think about which way is an angle, take this coordinate system and just turn it. Right? You're thinking that this is theta, but this is theta. Unfortunately, I drew it at about 45 degrees, so it's hard to tell. Okay? But imagine this ramp were just barely rotated. Then this NA, NB thing would just be barely rotated. And here's theta right here. Okay? So it rotated theta, and then we have the plus 90, because it was originally 90, and then theta. But yeah, you've got to watch those very careful. It's easy to miss. I understand why you had 90 degrees to the angle. So I just said again. Well, because the definition of getting the x component of a vector, when you go from polar to Cartesian, is you take the magnitude times the cosine of the angle counterclockwise from the x-axis. That is, that is the definition. That is just math. So I said 90, and then theta, 90 plus theta. Does anybody know the hustle? No, OK, I don't either. Uh, what was weight force? Why was not weight force not included in the sum? Um, oh, yeah. Let's add the weight. There we go, because it's vertical, right? It has no component in the x, right? That's why. Oh, oh, let's put it in. What the hell? Let's see. Plus m g cosine of negative 90. There you go. What's the cosine of negative 90? Zero, right? So that's the magnitude times the cosine of negative 90. You've made the lecture better, as if that's possible. Uh, so this equals zero, right? So plus zero equals zero, right? So that's the proper mathematical way to do it. All right? That's all it is. Now, the book tells you, oh, oh, oh no, put a negative sign in and call it sign. 
and just define the angle here. Oh, all right, no, don't do that. Or you can. You do whatever you want. I won't judge you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So if we keep going and we want to really solve this problem, instead of just acting like an idiot here, then we would say um, in A, like, OK, zeros, this goes over here. We divide by a cosine. And we find the intermediate result is in A is sine theta over cosine theta in B. So that's like one equation. Can NA and NB be negative? No. Those are magnitudes. Those have to be positive. That is the relationship between the two vector magnitudes. All right. But we have two unknowns, but we also are going to have two equations. Mm, why was the weight force not good? Oh, we did it. This thing warns me twice. Such a good question. My phone wanted to hear it again. Okay, so now we're going to do the y components. Okay? See what we get. So we also have zero net force in y. All right? Let's see what that gives us. Um, so now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say um, n a y plus n b y plus m g y equals zero. See, I meant to bring in the mg here, but you're right. I should have had it in here. I was also assuming things. So mgx is what we determined to be 0 up there. Um, OK, so let's see. N a y is what? Well, we have it in polar. We need it in Cartesian. And we know this is theta. And we know the definition. It's just n a sine theta. All right. So this is a component that can be negative. This is a magnitude. All right. What is the proper mathematical definition of the y component of this? It's nb sine of theta plus 90 again, because that's the angle all the way over. nb sine of theta plus 90. I should be saying pi over 2, I suppose. Um, OK. And now, what about mg? OK. Here's another question. Do you put a negative on the mg? Ah, uh, I don't know. Right? It's a little scary because I can say, don't put a negative on these. They'll tell you if there's a negative. But these are like vector components that could come out negative. mg isn't going to come out negative. Right? We know what m is. It's positive. We know g is defined as positive. How are we ever going to get this thing negative? We know it has to be negative. But you know, you just do the rules. You say plus the magnitude mg times the sine of, like we just said a minute ago, we spoiled it over here, negative 90, right? Sine of negative 90, minus 90. All those have to be equal to 0. And what is the sine of negative 90? Negative 1. OK. Can you explain how you got the angles again? Let's see. I need like a, uh, where's their room? Uh, so. I think of it this way. If the ball was here, this would be NB, and this would be N, or this would be, what the hell did I call them? Which one's A? This is NA, and this is NB. And we tilted it, right? We tilted the whole thing this way, then NA got tilted by theta, right? And NB got tilted by theta. So they both tilted this way by theta. Right. So, oh wait, did I switch up NB and NA? Let's see, uh, what did I do? I switched them, sorry. Uh, oh my god, never mind for that clarifying moment. OK, it's over, never mind. I screwed it up too much. Uh, no, I can't explain it, clearly. Uh, why is it negative 90, not 270? Uh, because it could be either one, the same thing. OK, so this is the origin of angles. We can go this way and call it negative. We can go this way and call it positive. It's less chalk if I make it negative 90, so that's why. OK, so we just keep going. We don't want to take all, we don't want to spend our entire day on this. N A sine theta plus, oh, what's the sine of theta plus 90? I don't, I don't have Google, I forgot, is uh, cosine plus N B cosine theta minus M G equals 0. That's what you'd probably just write if you're left to your own devices, right? 
So I showed you why it all happens. Okay, we laid it out. And now we just do algebra. Now we say, okay, this is basically the answer here. So we say, oh, let's just plug in in a here. So sine theta over cosine theta. Now this is just the algebra part, not very exciting. Uh, NB times the sine of theta. So all I did is I took that and stuck it right there. Plus NB times the cosine of theta minus MG equals zero. And now I'm going to pull a physics trick here. I'm going to multiply the whole thing by cosine theta. Is that allowed? Yeah, yeah sure. Why not? Why not? Multiply the left by cosine theta, it cancels that one on the NB, and you got NB sine squared theta. And then plus NB cosine squared theta. Cosine squared theta. And if you'll allow me, I'll put the MG on the other side and multiply it by cosine theta, and you get MG cosine theta. Right. And then you pull an NB, and you get sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals mg cosine theta. And what's sine squared plus cosine squared? One. So you get nb equals mg cosine theta. All right, so that is the value of the normal force in terms of m and g uh, and theta. Right? That's the nb normal force. And you want the na normal force. Oh, you just go there. You multiply by sine over cosine. The cosines cancel. And you get that na is m g sine theta, all right? So there's like, it took, took three boards to do something you would normally do super fast. But you got to do three boards if you want to think very carefully about vectors and then vector components and then calculating vector components. It takes a long time. That's why we usually just do it quick. So when we're doing it quick from now on for fun, we'll try to identify, is this a component or a magnitude or what? But knowing how to really do it can help you not get in trouble when things get complicated. Okay? Here's another thing that can help you out in doing problems like this. Um, is you can work in other coordinate systems. So let me just show you how easy, it's much easier this would have been in another coordinate system. And I'll show you why. And we'll even, let's see. So consider... Same question in uh, parallel and perpendicular to the ramp. Right. So basically, just we could turn our coordinate system and say, let's work in this uh, perpendicular direction and parallel direction. I'm even, I'm even going to use those like they're letters. Okay? You might see somebody say. Let's just redefine x and y this way. Could do that, but then the notes are, you know, then it'll look the same. You, some people might say put x prime and y prime, but those primes give people heart palpitations for some reason, so we're not going to do that. I'm going to call them parallel and perpendicular. Okay? So the exact same problem. Let's just solve it real quick. Um, let's look. And let, now we're going to do it kind of with the notation we would normally use. Parallel direction. It's not moving in the parallel direction, right? It's just sitting there. So let's just say, well, what, what's the deal? Um, well, we know that the uh, normal force in A is just along the parallel, parallel direction. So we don't have to do much. We just say in A. Is that a component or a magnitude? Uh, I think it's a magnitude. And then we say, well, what about the component of mg in that direction? Okay, so... Um, mg, and we're thinking about this direction, so we got to get a component like that for mg and like that for mg. All right. So this would be, let's see, so one thing you just got to eventually learn is that this theta equals that theta. All right. If you can't see that, think about what if theta went towards zero. If theta went towards zero, this angle would get really small, and this angle would get really small. So think about what angle shrinks to zero, if you can't tell that that's theta. And then you'd say, well, then this component is mg cosine theta. And this component is mg sine theta. So there you go. You look at that, and you say the component down the ramp is mg sine theta. And it's the opposite direction is a, so I'm going to put a negative sign on it. Now you're doing it the old way. 
Okay. If you want to do it the proper way, you'd say it's plus mg sine theta, and theta is negative, right? Oh, it's in the negative direction, or something like that. Right? You'd find a way to get there. I don't even know, because I don't really do it the full four board way. We all kind of do it this way. So if we're doing it this way, basically we are calculating the negative in our head. Okay, that's what we're doing. Yeah, let's see the technical answer. I don't know. Let's not get into it. We don't have time to do every one that way. So the answer is Na equals mg sine theta. Well, that was easy. It took a lot longer to do the other time, didn't it? And what about y? Some of the force, uh, the perpendicular direction, uh, also not moving. Therefore, we say Nb. Well, that's in the positive perpendicular direction. There we go. Right? It's got a perpendicular to the surface. It's got to just be NB. And which way is gravitational? Well, it's the other way. Right? It's uh, down. So we say minus mg cosine theta equals 0. And we say, oh, NB, the magnitude of MB is mg cosine theta. So why was it so much easier? Well, one reason is I didn't do the full formal notation. But the other reason is, here, we only had to break one vector into components, g. And here, we broke two vectors into components, normal a and normal b. And it's because we broke two vectors into components, we had to do all that algebra. If we just break one vector into components, then we're just done right at the beginning. Okay. So if you think about a problem of a block on a ramp, and later it'll be sliding, and there'll be friction, and normal forces, and wind, and tornadoes, and all this stuff will be blowing it around. All those forces will be this way, right? Friction's this way. Somebody pushing it is this way. A spring is this way. A, a rope is pulling. Everything is this way. The only thing this way is g, mg. So it makes sense to do your problems in this coordinate system, because then you don't have to deal with one vector's components. And you can see, even this simple problem, how much easier it was to work in this tilted coordinate system. Okay? So you can call it x prime, y prime. You can call it x and y. You can call it perpendicular parallel, but whatever you want to call it. But it is actually easier. What angles are the same for the different coordinate system? Um, uh, it's the same angle, right? So if this thing is on a ramp tilted at theta, then you just rotate your coordinate system by theta. So there's really still just one angle. It's just theta. That's the same theta. Okay. Okay. So I didn't do all the details here. So hopefully, but hopefully you see the connection, and hopefully it helps you assign negative signs. Okay. Cool. Wow. Okay. Here we go. So now we're going on to Newton's second law. Hmm. Wow, that was like 45 minutes on the normal force. I didn't think that was possible. All right. Uh, wow. Okay, Newton's second law. Answers the age old question what do forces do to an object. OK, so N2, all right, because we're running out of time. And that force on an object causes it to accelerate. According to the famous equation. And don't forget the sum sign. That'll help you remember it's the net force. It's not just any old force. The sum of the forces equals the mass times acceleration. Okay. So you want to know what all the squiggles on that equation mean. This reminds you that it's all the forces. It's technically all the external forces. But let's not worry about that. So it's the... It's, um, the net force is what the sum is reminding you of. It's the forces. This was the mass acceleration vector. Right? And that's it. Newton's second law. Pretty much all of mechanics is just that. Okay? It also answers that initial set of questions about what's the natural state of motion. The answer is constant velocity. Right? If anything is slowing down, if it's speeding up, it's because of a force, gravity. If it's slowing down, it's because of a force. Friction. It wants to keep going in the same velocity unless it's acted on by force. So now we know the ancient answer.
Okay. So we're going to do a quick problem using this, because what do you do? Once you calculate the force, then you just do kinematics. Okay. So we'll do a quick kinematics problem just to show you what they look like. It's not a hard one. All right. Or oh, we'll do friction next time. Let's see. OK, so the question is just how fast at the bottom for this situation. There's more to it than that. Let's see. So you have a mass sliding down a ramp. Right? The ramp is at theta. The mass is here, like that. And it's going to go a distance d. And then what's v final? That's the quick drawing of the question. OK. Uh, first, I would draw a free body diagram. Probably be the best thing to get started with. And the free body diagram, you're going to say, well, the uh, gravity is straight down, mg, or weight, if you prefer. And the perpendicular, or the normal force from the ramp is always perpendicular to the surface. So it's that way. We're not using our subscripts because we're only considering one normal force, but it's the normal force of the ramp on M. OK, we'll use a subscript. Ramp on M. OK? So now we do the kinematics. So now you can decide, is the normal force pushing it down the ramp? No. We should not do this. You could do this as a 2D kinematics problem, right? It's following this way, and it's following this way, and you can be all Cartesian about it. Don't. Right? This is one you want to rotate your coordinates and go down the ramp. Okay, so use the coordinate parallel to the ramp. It would be the efficient way uh, to do this problem. So you just apply Newton's law. You say some of the forces down the ramp equals the mass of acceleration down the ramp. I'll use my little parallel symbol. That's all you got to do. Okay, so what are the forces down the ramp? Well, the normal force gives you no force down the ramp because by definition it's perpendicular to the ramp. So it's only gravity, mg. So if we want that component, we say, well, mg is made up of a component going into the ramp and along the ramp. All right? And this angle is this angle. Because if I brought this angle towards 0, this would tilt up and it would go towards 0. So it's that one. It's not that one. This one would go to 90 if I brought it towards 0. Um, so then you just do your Sokotoa, and you say that's the opposite. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, because mg is the hypotenuse. There's the right triangle. So mg sine theta is the force down the ramp. All right? So we say mg sine theta. Is that a component or a magnitude? That's kind of vague, right? I haven't, I haven't told you which way is positive yet, so you don't really know. See how it can be arbitrary about the negative signs? I'm going to tell you that this is positive down the ramp, positive parallel direction. Therefore, that's a, magnitude, uh, that's a component, because it's going to be positive. Of course, I've defined theta negative, because I drew it this way, so God knows, right? Technically, theta is in the negative theta direction. So a bunch of negatives are going to cancel. See, this is why we don't do the detail every time. This is why we just look at it and say, OK, it's positive. It's down the ramp. I'm a pumpkin spice latte sitting, sipping basic whatever. I do it too. Um, equals mass times the acceleration down the ramp. Okay. And then we see the interesting thing about gravitational forces is that the mass goes away. Right? Motion is the accelerated motion depends on mass, but the gravitational force also depends on mass. It's almost like there's two masses. But why do they come out the same? We make them the same. Right, so that's the weird thing about mass. Let's not get into it. There's inertial mass and like quantity of matter mass. It goes away, and we find that the acceleration down the ramp is basically just g sine theta. Right, that's all you really need. And once you have that, then you do 1D kinematics. If you want to solve this now, hopefully from the last two weeks, you know exactly what to do. As you say, well, I'm accelerating. Am I accelerating for a distance, or am I accelerating for a time? Well, both. OK, am I accelerating? I've been given the distance or the time. You've been given the distance. And when you've been given the distance, you use the little shortcut formula, where we combine two other formulas, where v final squared equals v initial squared. Say we started from rest, plus 2. A, acceleration, is g sine theta. 
And then D, we gave you the easy D, right? Down the thing, right? We're going to give you an easy D, D. Right. So it's just a square root of 2G sine theta D. V final is a square root of 2G D sine theta, and that's the answer. Um, so there we kind of did it. It's almost, this, this comes up so often, it's almost worth memorizing that if you have something on a ramp at an angle theta, the force down the ramp is mg sine theta. That's just so common in so many problems. You know, you, you, that might be worth just having quickly something you can recall, right? The acceleration will be g sine theta if there's not other forces on it. But mg sine theta is the uh, force. <clears throat> All right. Oh, good Lord. Three minutes. What is this? this is friction. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can do friction and tension in one lecture. Oh, oh. Okay, we're done. I can't do, I can't do friction. <laughs>